Hello everyone and welcome to this London Vet Specialist webinar on protein losing enteropathy. I am Sivert Nedergen, the internal medicine consultant at LVS and I hope you will enjoy this presentation. So today we're going to go through a little bit about the pathophysiology behind um, PLE, the clinical presentation, differential diagnosis, diagnostics, the most common causes and uh, treatment, and we're going to finish with prognostic indicators. So the pathophysiology behind developing PLE is plasma protein loss into the gastrointestinal tract. Um, this could either be um, as panhypoproteinemia with loss of both albumin and globulin, versus in some cases you will only see hypoalbuminemia. Um, and PD will only develop when the protein loss is larger than the protein absorption capacity of the guts and also the liver production. Identification of PLE is based on the finding of hypoalbuminemia and um, it's important to then necessarily differentiate between other causes of hypoalbuminemia as well. What we tend to see as a cause of PLE is either a physical or, or a functional obstruction of lymphatics, um, which typically leads to an overflow of uh, lymph and leakage of lymph. This is typically caused by congenital or acquired lymphatic diseases like lymphangitis or primary idiopathic versus secondary lymphangiectasia. Release of cellular mediators affecting vascular permeability can also cause fluid to aggress into tissue or into intestinal lumen, um, for example seen in eosinophilic gastroenteropathy. Mucosal inflammation, um, typically divided into erosive and non-erosive, again will cause inflammation, damage to the tissues and leakage of protein. In each of these mechanisms, protein-rich fluid accumulates in the, in, intest in the intestines and passes into the gastrointestinal tract. Looking at this figure from um, a review by Craven and Vashabal, um, going from left to right, we see a normal villus on the left, um, and the first two or the next two villi um, are a figure of obstruction of lymphatics. In the first, um, where you can see lymphatic dilation, you would have a dysfunctional or um, non-functional lymphatic, where you have leakage of um, the lymphatic out from the villus into the lumen. Then. A worsening of this is when the leakage of the lymph causes inflammation and also could cause rupture of the lymphatics, which then will disrupt the normal architecture, but also will cause leakage of lymphatic or protein-rich fluid, in addition to, for example, lymph, uh, inflammatory cells as well. Crypt disease, which is the next two uh, rely um, in the figure, are is abnormal formation of protein rich and cell um, cellular fluid filled um, in these cyst formations within the crypts. These cysts can rupture and often are described by as abscesses by a pathologist without ne necessarily any pathogen as a cause. There's been multiple studies into this which have investigated, for example, parvo um, as a cause of uh, these cyst formations. Um, and also they've done uh, fish or fluorescent in situ hybridization to look for bacteria, which both were negative. This is actually a feature that is not uncommonly seen in Yorkshire Terrier and can cause PLE without necessarily any ob obvious inflammation of the gut. Then finally, and the most common cause in dogs, inflammation of the guts, which will cause leak disruption of the normal architecture, leakage of interstitial fluid, um, and um, 
than protein loss. Finally, you have a combination of the of uh, both inflammation and uh, mucosal inflammation. This can also sometimes, or this can be seen in both P uh, PLE caused by inflammatory uh, diseases, where you have the inflammatory cells actually obstructing the lymphatic vessel. But you can also see this in primary lymphangiectasia, where the lymph leakage into the tissue has caused inflammation. So in these cases, it can be really tricky to differentiate between what was the primary cause and what is the secondary cause. Clinical presentation. Um, so it's, we can start with the signalment. Um, most dogs are um, around kind of middle aged. Um, so the median in several studies is around about six to seven years, but there is a wide variation. And it can present in very young animal as, animals as well as old animals. There seem to be a male predominance in some studies and uh, well known pre breed predispositions um, in Yorkshire Terrier, Rottweiler, Lundehund, Basenji, South Dakota Witten Terrier, Pug, Border Collie and German Shepherd has been reported. Um, for those of you that do not know what is it, Lundehund is, it's a Norwegian breed um, and it's the top the, of the picture on the top right. Um, which is basically a puffin dog, and they're predisposed to primary lymphangiectasia. Um, a lot of these patients will will present with chronic GI signs. I think it's really important uh, to know that chronic we define chronic as uh, equal to more than three weeks of clinical signs. Um, also, it's really really important to note that some of these guys can only have intermittent signs. This can be quite tricky um, to uh, recognize in the busy first opinion practice. However, trying to review a history of the animal is important because if you have a patient that's been in six, seven times within the last six months with GI signs, then, then that would classify as a chronic um, gastrointestinal, or that would classify as chronic gastrointestinal signs. Some of these patients also just present with weight loss with or without obvious GI signs. For example, they can have a little bit of reduced appetite. And also occasionally you will only see these patients coming in because of consequences of the protein losing enteropathy. Some of these patients might come in with effusions or edema. Um, perhaps um, Yorkies are pre more commonly seen just presenting with, for example, ascites. Um, some of these patients can also come in with thrombobolic disease, for example, difficulty breathing, um, uh, or with signs of hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia, for example, with muscle tremors. Again, Yorkshire Terrier also seems to be predisposed to developing a clinically significant hypocalcemia. So, Kind of when we get these patients and we see that they have chronic intestinal disease, we also find that they um, are hypoproteinemic. Then the differential list isn't too bad, um, but there's definitely uh, several things to bear in mind. Um, I, I like to think about how we think, kind of think about these cases similarly to how we think about cases of non PLE GI causes. Um, so we kind of divide them into intestinal diseases and non-intestinal diseases. Non-intestinal diseases that can cause or, or look similar to a PLE is, um, for example, liver disease and portal hypertension. Um, these guys can present with low albumin and also um, ascites. Um, PLN is a very important differential as it can cause hypoalbuminemia as well. Um, Hypoadrenocorticism, so Addison's, um, it should be ruled out. Certain pancreatic diseases, for example, EPI, also can cause um, both chronic gastrointestinal signs and EPI uh, and PLE. And uh, third spacing from other diseases, for example, vasculitis as well, can sometimes look similar in the clinical presentation. Of the GI diseases, IBD, lymphangiectasia, and neoplasia would be the three most common causes for PLE. Um, 
we also have um, regional enteritis, which is usually that the disease process is located to one separate kind of area of the intestines, not particularly well characterized in veterinary medicine. Of infectious diseases, parvo naturally is a very important differential in a young or unvaccinated patient. Um, and depending on travel history, fungal diseases are more commonly seen in America. So if the patient comes from America, and especially, for example, around the Gulf, then histoplasm uh, and pythium should be considered. Of parasitic causes, um, giardia and hookworm or ankylostoma um, also can cause pili like um, disease. Um, and um, intersusception, in also more typically seen in a young animal, and, and intestinal ulceration, for example, in association with insect use, should also be considered. Moving on to diagnostics, when you have these cases and then kind of working your way through this differential list there are multiple tests that we would like to do so we're going to go through them we're going to go through them in uh, one after the other and we're going to start with hematology and it's not unusual that we can see lymphopenia uh, or a stress leukogram in a lot of these cases some of them will have eosinophilia and um, uh, some of them also might be anemic, especially if they have, for example, gastrointestinal blood loss. On biochemistry, hypoalbuminemia um, might be um, present in addition to hypoglobulinemia, but it's important to note that hypoalbuminemia in itself can occur and in a study from uh, Edinburgh in JVM 2019 only 50% had hypoglobulinemia in addition to the hypoalbuminemia. So in those cases where you just have hypoalbuminemia it, it is even more important to assess for example protein loss through the kidneys. In certain cases we can also see hyperglobulinemia with hypoalbuminemia um, and for example, in histoplasmosis, we can see this. Basenji has a, a separate type of a pre um, neoplastic disease, which is immunoproliferative, that can cause this as well. And we can sometimes see it in severe IBD or in elementary lymphoma. Hypercholesterolemia is also not commonly noted, and hypercalcemia and hypermagnesemia as well. Um, the re therefore, and based on the, that quite a few of these cases will only have hypoalbuminemia, we then would always want to do a urinalysis in UPC. Um, both because we want to rule out protein losing nephropathy, but also especially in soft-coated wheat interiors, we can have a combination of PLE and PLN, uh, which then would be important to, to diagnose and, and um, for treatment success. Then moving on to basal cortisol, um, so as we discussed before, Addison's is an important differential in some of these cases, and um, we there are two studies looking into whether we can use basal cortisol to rule out Addison's, and two studies showing that if the basal cortisol is um, more than 55 nanomoles per liter, then it's unlikely that the patient has hypogenocorticismal Addison's. Uh, however, if it's equal to or less than 55 nanomoles per liter, um, the patient should have an ACTH stim test because low basal cortisol is not diagnostic of hypogenocorticism. Um, and quite a few of these cases presenting with kind of PLE like signs does not necessarily have classical hypoadrenocorticism with your hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. And um, we call them atypical. And what it means is just that they've lost their um, um, glucocorticoid producing ability. And um, looking into um, whether there's any point in testing f during this test. Um, there is about a 4% prevalence in the population of dogs with gastrointestinal signs. And um, when you look at the general dog population, 
uh, the prevalence of Addison's by and large, both typical and atypical, um, was 0.09% from a Swedish insurance data. Therefore, it is a higher prevalence within dogs with gastrointestinal signs and therefore should be performed to ensure that this the patient with the PLE is not, um, has Addison's. Um, and also important to note that, that about 15% of the atypical cases, if you diagnose one, um, will develop electrolyte disturbances, most of them within um, six months, but up to 51 months after diagnosis. So regular re-examinations are important. Um, a lot of these cases will also have melina or hematochesia. Uh, cobalamin and folate are also commonly performed in these cases, and hypocobalaminemia is quite common. Um, so depending on the study you look at, between 20 and 60% of dogs with PLE have hypocobalaminemia. Actually, it, and also it's actually been shown to have, um, it's associated with a negative outcome. Um, Hypophalatemia is also fairly common in these guys, and it was reported up to 40% in one study. And... Um, it, it, it probably is, um, in a lot of these cases, could point in the direction of malabs or reduced absorption of folate in the proximal small intestines. Um, it also is dependent on appetite and the diet they're eating. Um, so it's important to uh, keep that in mind when you see a low folate. And also, um, low folate does not change your plan necessarily, or it changes your prognosis. So at the moment, it might be less commonly performed. TLI and CPLI, we tend to perform these tests depending on clinical signs. Um, and especially if you have a, a case where you're suspicious of, um, for example, EPI, TLI is very sensibly to be performed. Um, but it's important to know that you can be falsely lower than PLE. Interestingly, um, it's also been shown that an increase in CPI and inflammatory bowel disease um, is associated with a negative outcome. So potentially it could be used as a prognostic indicator as well. However, it can be quite a costly, um, costly test to run. So it might be more sensible to spend the money on something else. Fecal analysis as well is very sensible to perform. Um, most of the time we do fecal flotation where sink flotation is the most commonly performed. But it's also important to remember that some um, Parasites might not be as readily found on that type of flotation, so bearmen could be considered to find strongyloides. Rectal scrape cytology is also can be performed and is not as commonly performed, unless, for example, you're looking for histoplasmosis, which can be diagnostic. Um, and sometimes the rectal scrape can also diagnose neutrophilic inflammation, which might be helpful um, in your management of the case. Giardia lysa or PCR um, can, should be performed as well to rule out uh, Giardia um, or uh, you can do a three-day sink flotation, all of which have similar sensitivity and specificity. Culture um, is infrequently performed. We typically do it if they're systemically unwell. They have um, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, they're fed a raw food diet, or you have a neutrophilic rectal scrape. Then moving on to... This might be a little bit more on the side or might be something that we'll see more commonly used in the future. Um, these are definitely, there's quite a lot of research going on to these non-invasive biomarkers. And biomarkers are serum or fecal markers that could help diagnose patients with little or no clinical signs, other than, for example, hypoalbuminemia. Um, in some of these biomarkers, also potentially could help predict treatment response. Um, the biomarkers on this slide have, have been investigated in dogs and um, to assess their usefulness, and especially uh, you might have read some papers on chronic GI disease, and some of these might have cropped up. Um, as I said, they're commonly used in research and also used in human medicine. Um, and um, 
it's starting at the top with C-reactive proteins. So CRP is an acute phase protein that is produced in response to inflammation and interleukin-6. Um, unfortunately, it's had variable results um, in, in both chronic enteropathies and also PLE cases, and it's all, only increased in about 43% of PLE cases. There are some studies su suggesting that it is a prognostic factor, whilst others do not. And also, um, it does not correlate with treatment responders or non-responders. So at this time, the jury is a little bit out on the use of C-reactor protein in these cases. S108.12 is the calcium binding protein secreted by activated neutrophils. Again, results are variable uh, with some studies showing reasonable sensitivity and specificity for um, gut disease, whilst another study um, revealed that it was not able to identify dogs with PLE versus non-PLE. It has been um, associated with negative or a, a poor pronostic um, outcome in one study uh, but again the verdict is out on this um, marker. Calprotectin is another neutrophil cytosol protein again it's it's fairly sensitive but it's poorly specific and was a negative factor in one study in dogs. Whilst Alpha-1 proteinase inhibitor, um, it's commonly done um, on feces. Unfortunately, it's rarely used in clinical practice and also um, can be difficult to actually get a lab to run it. Um, Texas A&M used to do it. Um, and basically it's used um, because it's lost, uh, similar to albumin lost over the guts. However, albumin is degraded by bacteria and alpha-1 proteinase inhibitor is not. Um, therefore, one, if one found an increased amount in the poo, that would be an indicator of protein loss um, through the guts. And... Um, you could potentially call it the UPC of the feces and it could be very useful in the screening tool of, for example, um, breeding uh, individuals of a, of a breed that is predisposed to developing PLE, but also could be helpful in the cases where they have little or no GI signs. Um, however, it's unfortunately still rarely used and, and not readily available. Um, there are some other um, novel serum markers. There's a fairly recent study looking into that was IBD dogs, not PLE, where there were some inflammatory markers or serological markers that were increased. And basically, a panel of these serological markers could be helpful in diagnosing IBD versus normal dogs. Um, and there might be that there's something in the future where we basically have a panel that you can send in to help um, assess whether this patient might or might not have PLE. Um, also, uh, interestingly, um, in ESVM 2019, there was some discussions about artificial intelligence or machine learning, where uh, basically you can plot in clinical science and lab data and then use the, a computer system to assess whether there was, it was likely for this patient to have um, GI disease, which potentially also is a, a something to look for in the future. In cases presenting with ascites, naturally it's very important to do an abdominal synthesis to um, uh, assess what type of ascites it is, whether it's um, hemorrhagic, transudate, exudate, etc. Um, and whether we do bilateral stimulation test, PTH, vitamin D measurements and magnesium measurements also depends on how suspicious we are that the patient might have a liver disease versus, and um, whether the hypercalcemia might be associated with some other disease, for example, primary hypoparathyroidism, um, uh, rather than um, gut loss. TEG is com sometimes used in the diagnosis of um, hyper coagulability and it has been shown that a lot of these inflammatory um, gut diseases the patients are hypercoagulable uh, with the increased risk of thromboembolic disease. Parvosnap and infectious disease testing naturally depending on the history, vaccination versus non-vaccinated animals and also travel history.
Then finally, we tend also to do imaging. So we tend to do thoracic radiographs or, or thoracic CT. We look for underlying causes um, for, um, or sorry, rule out underlying causes such as heart failure, especially if it's ascites, um, chronic diaphragmatic hernia, or complications of disease such as aspiration pneumonia. Ultrasound is very commonly performed both uh, to help both increase suspicions of um, underlying causes. For example, if you have a thickening um, of the mucosa, it's quite commonly seen. Um, and also um, concurrent lymphadenopathy allows for a higher suspicion of lymphoma. And also, for example, sampling of those lymph nodes. Um, Hyperechoextrations are suggestive of lymphangiectasia with a sensitivity of 75% and a specificity of 96%. So in some of these cases, if we don't see hyperechoextrations, we definitely can't rule out lymphangiectasia. And also remember, it's important to know that lymphangiectasia is a histological diagnosis, so we need biopsies to fully um, diagnose it. But the changes or finding of hyperechoextrations can be useful. Um, also, we use abdominal ultrasound to differentiate between focal or diffuse disease, which again will uh, guide further investigations such as biopsies. If we think it's a focal disease that is out of reach from our, our endoscopy or an endoscope, then we typically would go in surgically to take out biopsies. Um, Ultrasound can also diagnose thromboembolic disease, for example, um, for, um, clots in major abdominal vessels. Um, and like I said, it can be very useful in the sampling both of, of for example, large lymph nodes or focal intestinal wall lesions if you have a thickened wall. So going, having done all those investigations and we haven't really necessarily diagnosed anything, that leaves us with the these three primary differentials, such as inflammatory bowel disease, lymphangiectasia, um, and um, neoplasia, and to be to further be able to differentiate between the bio, uh, between them, biopsies are necessary. So, like I said, to further differentiate between the three, then we end up doing biopsies. Biopsies can either be done surgical. Surgical biopsies will give us full thickness analysis of the, the guts. Um, it's uncommonly performed. Usually it's done in cases where there's a focal lesion outside the reach of the endoscopy or um, concurrent disease outside the GI where we also want biopsies of, for example, um, the liver. Um, there are some advantages to taking um, surgical biopsies. Like I said, we can multiple we can biopsy multiple sites. It permits large um, biopsies. It also offers potential corrective surgery. Um, and um, for example, in cases with, for example, interception, um, disadvantages would be that. Um, you need general anaesthetic, there's a surgical risk, uh, potential of the hastens and development of septic abdomen. And we know that hypoalbuminemia has been associated with a higher risk of complications. It also requires reconvalescence and delay before we can start treatment. Um, we also know that hypervitaminosis D and hypercalcemia is associated with adverse effects on wound healing and intestinal repair. And also thrombus formation is higher in surgery compared to endoscopy. With endoscopic biopsies, it does require 24 to 48 hours of starving um, and quality of the biopsies is skill dependent and also equipment dependent. Um, we, cannot we cannot access all the intestines and usually we can just only access the, prox the initial part of the small intestines and also potentially the, the very end or the ileum if we do a lower endoscopy as well. Um, the um, benefits of endoscopy is that they're, it's minimally invasive, it allows the visualization of the lumen, which surgery typically doesn't. You can take biopsy of focal lesions, it per permits multiple biopsies, minimal risk and also allows steroid treatment to, start, be, to be started early.
Disadvantages to endoscopy, uh, again, you need to do general anesthesia. There's a small risk of perforation. It only uh, um, permits access to the duodenum um, and the proximal ju ju jejunum only in small dogs and cats. Um, like I said, ileum is only accessible if you do a lower or a colonoscopy as well. And the biopsies are typically small, they're quite superficial, and potentially um, we can also crush the biopsies. We could miss intestinal lymphangiectase and lymphoma because they can be in one area of the gut as well as not the other. Um, and also the, the equipment is quite expensive. Um, Interestingly, um, if you look at the picture up to the right, um, this patchy or the white tipped um, intestinal villi or lymphatic fluid in the intestinal lumen um, and grossly abnormal duodenal appearance only has a 68% specificity and 42% sensitivity for intestinal lymphangiectasia. So even, even in cases where you can't see white tipped intestinal villi or lymphatic fluid, um, you could still have significant intestinal lymphangiectasia. Um, so kind of progressing then to the most common diseases that we see, um, lymphoplasmocytic enteritis is by far the most common cause of um, PLE in dogs. Um, in a recent review, um, found that uh, Lymphoplasmocytic enteritis was the most common cause in 314 out of 469 cases, about 70%. And um, lymphangiectasia was noted in 58% of uh, cases, so some of them had both. Um, and um, we do think that quite a few of these have secondary lymphagiectasia. Basically, it, it's a result of obstruction of lymphatic flow by inflammatory cells. It causes the leakage of lymphatic fluids, which again triggers further inflammation and permeability. So if you're remembering what we went through in patho when we discussed pathophysiology, um, the um, really on the right of that um, figure, basically will be the, the uh, drawing of this happening. Um, it also might be that we're underestimating the amount of cases with secondary lymphangiectasia um, as immunolabeling um, of lymph vessels actually show that there was quite a few lymph vessels that were missed on routine histopathology. The second most common disease causing PLE in dogs is lymphangiectasia. Lymphangiectasia um, can be divided into primary and secondary, and primary is congenital um, most commonly, and is basically absorb abnormal lymph vessels that are not working normally, and we cause leakage of lymph into um, the lumen or in the interstitium. This leakage into especially into the interstitium will cause inflammation as lymph is inflammatory and uh, can also in some cases cause granuloma formation. Breeds that are predisposed to primary lymphangiectasia are soft coated Wheaton Terriers, Lundehund, Yorkie, Maltese, and Sharp Hay. Um, as we previously noted on imaging, um, we can see sometimes we can see lacteal dilation and that will look like hyperechoextrations in the mucosa. This has a low sensitivity, so you can't rule out um, lymphangiectasia on ultrasound if it's not there, but it is fairly specific. So if you do find it, that makes you suspicious of lymphangiectasia. It can be... Um, focal so in some cases you will see it just in certain areas whilst not in others therefore typically we would um, ask for multiple biopsies both from endoscopy but also if they go in um, the surgeons go in and take full thickness biopsies on endoscopy seeing milk-like dilation of really rely tips um, as you can see in the photo on the right has a 68% sensitivity and 42% specificity for lymphangiectasia so again you need your histopathology to to diagnose it as 
also previously noted, there is an underestimation of lymph vessels without specific staining. So there might be in the future that um, the pathologist will do special staining when they do get gastrointestinal biopsies to further kind of find these abnormal vessels. Secondary lymphangiectasia is also really important and can be really difficult to differentiate between uh, or from primary because if primary causes inflammation um, in the tish tissues that is noted on biopsies, then secondary lymphangiectasia, for example, to inflammatory bowel disease might look very similar. Um, other causes of secondary lymphangiectasia can be right-sided heart failure and also neoplasia. Neoplasia of the cancerous processes that can cause PLE, lymphoma would be the most common cause. There are two types, and um, we call it small cell lymphoma or low-grade lymphoma. It, um, it generally has a quite a good survival um, compared to um, those that has non-neoplastic causes of PLE if it's treated, depending a little bit on um, the paper that you look at, and it's unfortunately not a lot of literature out there, uh, but mean survival is between 400 and 700 days with small cell lymphoma. Um, anemia and weight loss in one paper um, prior to presentation was associated with worse outcome, so they would probably live a little bit shorter than the four to 700 days. High-grade lymphoma um, is unfortunately um, associated with a poor outcome and would need a multi-agent um, chemotherapy um, treatment protocol, but still um, a lot of these dogs will succumb to the disease quite quickly. Um, Lymphoma, unless it's found as a single mass, which is unusual, is most of the time diagnosed with endoscopy. Surgical biopsies um, naturally will also be diagnostic, but there is a high risk of the hissens uh, following the procedures. Um, interestingly, it is also important to note that ultrasonographic evidence of loss of layering gives a 50 times increase in the likelihood of neoplasia in one study. In dogs, both ad adenomas and adenocarcinomas are found more commonly in the large intestine than in the small intestines. Carcinoma has a predilection for the duodenum, and the tumors are typically locally infiltrative and ex can extend to the serosa and the mesentery. They tend to metastasize to local lymph nodes and or the peritoneal cavity, um, as well as hematogenic hematogenously um, and therefore um, the clinical signs um, typically actually relate to a partial for example a partial obstruction or uh, peritonitis if perforation of the bowels have occurred um, or in some cases carcinomatosis can be seen typically presenting with for example ascites um, abdominal palpation can re reveal a focal thickening, and again, if it's a, um, an ulcerated um, mass, they can definitely also have melina and also anemia. Then moving on to treatment, we're going to go through diet, antihelminthics, immunosuppressive treatment, anticlotting, vitamin B D and vitamin B12 treatments. So diet, the diet is a key factor in the treatment of these patients when, um, and when we kind of look at chronic enteropathies as a whole, more than 70% of cases tend to respond to a diet. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to PLE, um, it is likely less so, but some breeds, for example, the Yorkshire Terrier, um, normalization of clinical signs and albumin can be achieved with a uh, diet. Diet that we tend to use in these patients can either be hydrolyzed, low fat, or novel protein diets. As a general rule, we want the diets to be easily digestible, preferably in the low um, end of fat content due to the previously discussed prevalence of lymphangiectasia. 
but primarily secondary, but also to improve movement throughout the gastrointestinal tract as higher fat meals have slower gastrointestinal transit time and, for example, can contribute to vomiting. There are limited evidence in comparing the diet types um, to one another. However, there are some weak evidence that dogs fed a hydrolyzed diet might be better than other diets. Um, this re the, the, kind of the reason behind that might be a combination of digestibility, but also that a hydrolyzed diet might not trigger a hypersensitivity reaction, and as such, more dogs might have a better outcome. When it comes to low-fat diets, um, they are more commonly used in cases of lymphangiectasia, for example in Lundehunds, where we know it's primary, um, and diets like Royal Canaan GI Low Fat or Hills low F ID Low Fat um, might be enough to control the signs. It is also important to remember that wet food tends to contain less fat than dry. Um, some dogs, however, might need a um, home-cooked ultra-low-fat diet, um, but difficulties with these home-cooked diets is that they might not contain enough fat or fat-soluble vitamins, and therefore it is of utmost important that these diets are balanced by a board-certified veterinary nutritionist. Um, and we can also use um, some indications for uh, kind of in the history or in the clinical scoring um, to look for a response. So um, if the patient has a CCECAI um, score less than 8, um, they might be more likely to respond to a diet. Um, young patients as well might be more likely. Um, and uh, there is a mounting or some early evidence that assist feeding as well might have a positive outcome in these cases. So this is again taken from Craven and Varshabao um, review, where um, basically it's an overview of, of the most commonly used um, diets um, that we use in these patients. And then if you start with the low-fat diets, we can see that Royal Canaan GI low-fat, Hills ID low-fat, and Purina EN low-fat, they're all um, quite low in fat, less than 10%, and um, most of them around about kind of 6 to 8% the, in the dry form, and the wet form, again, has a lower fat percentage, which is important to note. Um, Then, if we then look at the hydrolyzed diet, then you can see that hypoallergenic, analogenic ZD and Purina HA. Again, if you look at the, the fat percentage, um, Purina HA has the lowest fat content um, of these diets, except for the wet form of Hills ZD, which only has 3.5%. So that could be a viable option for patients that, for example, have IBD with secondary lymphangiectasia. Um, Analogenic and hypoallergenic also have um, not too bad a fat percentage, but again, they're not as low as the wet ZD or the Purina HA. Then, as we alluded to a little bit earlier, moving on to um, assisted feeding, and this is a really important question, and I think all patients that have chronic GI signs, and especially the PLE patients, um, it should um, have a con we should consider assisted feeding, placing an old tube and then G or N O tube. Um, in all these patients. Um, we tend to recommend assisted feeding if they've been anorexic for more than three to five days, um, or we suspect that they need nutritional support over time. And by that, we mean typically patients that had variable appetite over a period of time. Um, and um, uh, we tend to actually be a bit more aggressive in patients that are very young or very old. Um, in patients that are severely cachectic or have had or has a protracted periods of anorexia. So that can be a patient that's been anorexic for a, 
um, a number of days before a presentation, but actually is eating okay at the time of presentation, we would still recommend the feeding tube in those cases. And also it's important to remember obese cats um, as these um, patients can go on to develop hepatic lipidosis if they're not eating. We feed them to their resting energy requirement, or RER, um, and um, we use the for, or the calculations as written to the right on the slide. And if the weight is between two and thirty kilos, we probably the majority of the patients will be. Um, then we can do use the simplified version, which is thirty times body weight in kilo plus seventy. We tend to start at 30 or 25 or 30 percent of the IRR and then increase daily, for example, up to 60, 90, and 100 percent, or 25, 50, 75, and 100. Um, we tend to feed them four to six meals per day to ensure that the, the amount of food given through the tube isn't too much. Um, and um, we generally um, have stopped using the illness factors. Um, because we tend to see some or we have seen some overfeeding complications um from it and also most patients um kind of the idea of the assisted feeding is to to um, ensure that the enterocytes um get and it has enough energy and also to kind of kick start their their appetite again in addition there are some mounting um evidence um where actually assisted enteral feeding might improve the treatment outcome in dogs with inflammatory PLE. And this is from the RVC. It was a um, an abstract presented at ECVIM where they had 57 dogs with PLE, 20 had enteral feeding and 37 had non-enteral feeding. Um C C E C I A um score was higher in the enteral feeding group versus the non-enteral feeding group. Um, positive outcome was seen, which they, they set as alive after four months, was seen in 75% of the enteral feeding dogs and just 46 in the non-enteral feeding group. Um, and um, it, there was an odds ratio of 3.2 for a positive outcome with feeding. So this is the first uh, study to show positive outcome with the feed with the assisted feeding and it's probably because of increased nutritional intake uh, improved compliance with both medications but also sticking to one singular diet um, rather than an animal being fed a lot of random um, feeds foods at home um, and also um, assisted treat assisted feeding will address malnutrition this was a retrospective study, so we can't say for certain that that this is um, kind of hundred percent true. So there is, I think, there is a plan for a prospective study to be performed, um, and it's also seen in people that assisted feeding can can um, improve the outcome as well in people with more than five days of anorexia. Then. To kind of summarize, um, again, diet is a key tr treatment factor, um, and it is really, really important that these patients are given a proper diet. Um, and we tend to do a fa fat restricted diet in patients with lymphangiectasia, hydrolyzed diet in, in dogs with inflammatory bowel disease, or a combination of a hydrolyzed and a fairly low fat um, in dogs with IBD and lymphangiectasia. Um, novel protein um, diets are sometimes used in cases with picky appetite or potentially skin disease. Um, home cooked again only use that if it's balanced by a board and nutritionist and really strongly cons consider assisted feeding. Remember when you're feeding one of these diets we generally recommend for these patients only to be on the diet and avoid any type of tidbits or treats and for example dentistics to try to avoid any triggers that can make the disease worse. 
We also tend to avo- advise for antamintics to be given, and typically what we advise is 50 mg per kg of embendazole for five consecutive days. This is to ensure that we're treating, for example, um, any giardia um, infection that might not have been picked up on the even on on the fecal sample. Then moving on to immunosuppressive treatment, which is quite commonly used. Um, unfortunately, we do know that um, most of the chronic enteropathy patients have a better prognosis if it's dietary responsive. It also means that if they do respond to a diet, then it's um, usually associated with, for example, less side effects from, from drug use. And we also hope, even with drug use, that some of these patients can kind of be maintained on the diet after stopping or, or reducing the glucocorticoid or the second agent use. By that, I mean um, that in some cases we are forced to start them on glucocorticoids, the second agents, because their clinical signs are so severe that we can't wait for and see whether the patient will have a diet, response to diet, which can take up to two to three, four weeks. Um, therefore, in, in a lot of these cases, we end up um, starting, for example, glucocorticoids. That tends to, that is the first line treatment because it has a rapid effect. And um, most commonly, we use immunosuppressive doses of prednisolone, dexamethasone, or budesonide. Um, and in PLE, most commonly, dexamethasone and prednisolone are used. We tend to use dexamethasone mostly for the, the hospital up, hospitalized patients that are quite ill um, or in patients where we are concerned about the gastrointestinal absorption of oral treatment as well, typically by then prednisolone. Also, I think it's really important to us to remember that glucocorticoids have a wide range of adverse effects, especially with chronic use. And um, there is an aim for these patients to, if not come off, um, the steroids or the glucocorticoids definitely to try to reduce it to the the minimal effective dose. Um, most of these patients, you would be, the, of the patients that do respond to treatment, you'll be able to reduce the dose significantly, um, which also then would reduce um, the number of side effects. In some cases, for example, in very large dogs um, where glucocorticoid side effects will be quite severe, then we tend to add a second agent or in patients where we um, are not necessarily seeing an, an improvement quite rapidly from the glucocorticoid treatment. And um, in those cases, we tend to add in second agents such as cyclosporin, chlorambucil, acetylopurine, and mycophenolate. Um, at the moment, there's no evidence of better outcome with the combina- combined treatment. Um, however, there are some evidence that, for example, in non-PLE cases, that cyclosporin in one case, oh, sorry, one case series, um, save dogs from euthanasia. So it might be that some patients of the PLE group as well will benefit from a second agent. And unfortunately, there's limited evidence to tell us which one is the quote unquote the best. Um, there's one study looking into the use of prednisolone plus crambacil versus prednisolone plus azathioprine, um, where more dogs were alive um, in the prednisolone crambacil group compared to the prednisolone azathioprine group. Um, however, um, it, we do, it's not very strong evidence, but it might be that um, chlorambazil might have a, a benefit in these cases compared to azathioprine. It also is important to remember that these uh, drugs can also have also has its own set of side effects. For example, mycophenolate, chlorambazil, and azathioprine can also cause GI toxicity. So, again, vomiting and diarrhea, but also myelosuppression. suppression. Um, per- at least, perhaps, mycophenolate. Um, in mycophenolate, we can see GI toxicity quite commonly. And um, also, in cyclosporin, we can see a transient vomiting and diarrhea. But, it, again, it tends to be time-limited, or if they only stick to the treatment, it tends to pass by itself.
then additional treatment um, that can also um, or also should be considered would be anti-clotting medications because thromboemboli is seen in about 6% of PLE cases but we're probably underestimating it. Um, as we previously discussed we, we see um, hypercoagulability in um, quite or in quite a lot of these cases, if not all, and um, also it's also important to remember that dogs in clinical remission of their disease m remain hypercoagulable. So the treatment that can be used is either low molecular heparin, low dose aspirin, or clopidogrel. Amongst these, probably clopidogrel is the most commonly used. Um, but again, we're lacking evidence as to which one is the best one in these cases. Um, B12 should be supplemented if low. So um, Texas A&M has a really nice internet page, um, which is copied in here. I would definitely go um, and have a read of this. They also will they also give um, out the protocols that are recommended for either inject did or injectable B12 versus oral um, and also interestingly there might be that we also see low B12 in patients being fed an unbalanced diet for example raw food diet um, so it's also important to have again to have the diet history in these patients to figure out whether the B12 actually might be related to an unbalanced diet. We also don't know whether then changing that patient over to a balanced diet might normalize the B12, but the recommendation at this point is still to supplement if it is low. Um, we tend only to use vitamin D treatment if um, the patient is hypoglycemic and it's causing clinical signs. I think also in quite a lot of these cases, um, it is really important to to treat them with antinausea and appetite stimulants, both because A, we want to make sure that these patients start to eat by themselves, but also that they're comfortable. Um, for example, meropidant or ondansetron can be used for this. And um, continuing these medications after the patient has been sent home might be also a consideration to make. Um, treatment of dysmotility, so if the patient has ileus, then starting a metroclopramide, or sorry, is regurgitating, then metroclopramide, for example, CRI um, or um, cisapride orally should be considered. Antibiotics, we don't really have any evidence that these patients need antibiotics. Of course, it, antibiotics should be considered if the patient, you're concerned that the patient might be septic. Um, however, um, there's no evidence that a PLE dog will do better with antibiotics rather than um, not needing antibiotics or not receiving antibiotics. And we also know that antibiotics will skew the microbiota potentially for months after treatment, um, which again, we don't really know whether that might have a negative effect on these patients. Probiotics, on the other hand, there's variable evidence, and none of which is quite none of which is strong, um, but rarely you will do any harm. Um, so, um, probiotics should be a consideration. However, if the animal is already already receiving a, a a wide variety of medications, it might be something to consider to to drop out because of the variable evidence. Um, for basically for um, compliance um, purposes. Oncotics and Porsche. So if you have a patient with peripheral edema um, and a severe hypoalbuminemia, treatment with um, oncotic support such as colloids um, or plasma transfusions or canine albumin can be transiently helpful. Uh, we try to avoid it and we would rather rather prefer, for example, enteral feeding, as this might help increase the protein levels higher, uh, quicker and more consistent, more persistently. Um, and we sometimes will use oncotic support, for example, um, during general anesthesia or, or prior to general anesthesia to stabilize the patients. Um, 
it is important to remember that the treatment of the underlying cause is going to be more helpful than oncotic support. Um, and it, we also see side effects such as volume overload or transfusion reactions. Um, and that would ne need to be discussed bef with the owners before administration. And a reaction could cause further worsening of effusions and edema. Um, parenteral nutrition, again, um, is also something that could be considered but should be performed in an ICU setting or at least with very close control of um, somewhere where you can control um, the environment for the patient. And it's generally something that, again, we try to avoid and we'd rather have entry support. The prognosis of PLE patients is unfortunately guarded. Um, looking at um, the papers available, there is about a 50-50 chance of survival or response to treatment. We also know that quite a few of these cases would need have flare-ups and repeated need of hospitalisation. So it is an expensive disease for the owners and also it is really important to, to make them aware of the, about the 50-50 chance of, of response and survival in these cases. There are some prognostic markers that, that might be helpful. Um, for example, the CCECIA scoring, we know that the higher the score, the worse the outcome. Um, in one paper, more a score of more than 12 was associated with death within three years. Um, more than five at one month after initiation with treatment. Um, these patients were more likely to die within six months. Um, and also improvement in scoring with treatment is associated with long-term outcome. So if you have a patient, for example, scoring at eight, that with treatment goes down to a one or a two, um, is more likely to have a better outcome compared to one that is persistently 12. Um, albumin, we know that hyperalbuminemia is associated with a poor outcome compared to patients that do not have hyperalbuminemia. So PLE cases are more severe than non-PLE cases and has a worse prognosis. Um, and we can't find that the level of the hyperalbuminemia is associated with the outcome, but it might be that that's something that future studies might um, uh, make us reconsider. Um, hypocobalaminemia also is associated with a negative outcome. We also know that um, urea, so an increased urea has a poor survival. Um, and um, if uh, the urea, urea in one study was less than seven millimoles per liter, they had almost 300 days longer survival compared to the ones with the urea of more, of more than seven. Vomiting has also been reported to be a negative prognostic marker in one study. Um, then on histopathology, blunting of villi has been associated with negative outcome, tryptophan concentrations as well, um, and vitamin D metabolites, and actually the degree of hypervitaminosis D was shown. So the more severe hypervitaminosis D, the worse outcome. Um, canine PLE, uh, sorry, PLI, um, has also been associated with um, a negative outcome, so increase in the CPLI. Um, in this paper, the patients with PTS that follow up um, compared to the ones that had a normal PLI. Um, CRP, again, variable results, body condition scoring, also variable uh, results. However, muscle condition or uh, as well, or an undernutrition score, um, has not been reported and there are some research looking into this so that's a place to to keep an eye out for whether that plays a role which we do think um, treatment provided again as we discussed before the diet alone versus diet plus immunosuppression um, we know that diet alone has a better outcome and then um, assisted enteral feeding has a positive a prognostic marker in one abstract. So it, basically what I'm t kind of taking from this is that for most parts you you will not necessarily measure vitamin D 
Um, and um, from a clinical point of view, the clinical index scoring might be useful. You will have albumin, you would tend to have cobalamin values as well available, urea as well. So of these prognostic markers, at least you can tell the owner that he might have some negative prognostic markers. But again, it's not be all or end all. So even a patient with negative prognostic markers might respond to treatment. So it is worthwhile to try. Um, these are the references amongst, um, I think most of them are there, but um, there might be some that I've missed out. If you have any questions or any comments, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, the easiest probably is to uh, email lvs at londonvetspecialists.vet. Thank you.